The next topic of the session is unloading of left ventricle in peripheral VA ECMO. And for this, I invite Dr. Niren Bhavasar. He is lead consultant cardiothoracic anesthesia and solid organ transplant anesthesia at CIMS Hospital Ahmedabad, Gujarat. Dr. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Bala sir, Dr. Suresh Rao sir, and uh, Dr. Murli for inviting me and allowing me to uh, speak upon this August uh, gathering. I will be speaking on the unloading of left ventricle in peripheral VA ECMO. I mean, uh, from the previous talk, it is established that the VA ECMO has role in uh, cardiogenic shock, definitely. So, this may be an example of how to proceed with the uh, refractory shock condition. And uh, uh, you know, the configuration of ECMO is ranging from the central VA ECMO to peripheral VA ECMO. The central ECMO though offers a good peripheral flow, cardiac perfusion and unloading of both the ventricles is complicated by bleeding and need for repeated sternotomies and uh, it is not always available uh, when if it is required on the bedside. Uh, while peripheral uh, cannulation uh, uh, provide good flow but at the same time increasing the loading condition of the left ventricle and leads to LV distension and that jeopardizes the recovery of a failing already failing ventricle. Uh, to look at this figure uh, as the flow in a peripheral VA ECMO increasing uh, you know then there will be an increase in the afterload which leads to reduced, uh, I mean, reduced uh, contractility of the LV, LV distension, aortic wall uh, opens uh, less frequently and there may be even it doesn't open. This leads to further LV distension. So, this is relevance that, you know, the literature su uh, suggests that that failure to recognize, anticipate and treat LV distension and uh, unloading uh, the left ventricle has a grave consequences. So, whenever it is filled, it has to be unloaded. What exactly happens in peripheral VA ECMO is that because of the retrograde flow from the femoral artery, there is an increase, supraphysiological increase in the afterload to the left ventricle, which leads to uh, further LV dilatation. There is a reduction in the LV contractile function because of increasing the afterload and the wall stress increases. All this leads to, uh, like in acute condition, leads to myocardial ischemia because of subendocardial uh, perfusion uh, reduction. The aortic wall uh, may remain closed, which leads to further dilatation of the LV. There is an increase in the LA pressure uh, because of incompetent mitral wall. All this leads to either geopardized recovery of the left ventricle or pulmonary edema and hypoxia. And that further worsens the clinical scenario. And if we do not break this vicious cycle, uh, then it may uh, deteriorate further. And uh, our goal and purpose of uh, putting a VA ECMO is taken away. What happens in two different situations, like in acute cardiogenic shock, uh, the LV distension leads to subendocardial ischemia, worsening the myocardial injury, and that job is recovery. While in chronic, uh, I mean acutely decompensated chronic heart failure patients, there is some degree of MR which uh, may, uh, you know, this concomitant MR will become uh, worsen and leads to further dilatation of LV, and that increases the load of the LA also, which reflected into the pulmonary edema and hypoxia. In worse situation, when the aortic valve doesn't open, there will be stasis of blood into the left ventricle and aortic root, which can lead to LV thrombus, LV or aortic root thrombus formation and embolic complications in the uh, in the coronaries or in the brain or in the peripheral circulation. If you look at this diagram of uh, PV loop of left ventricle. On the right side, you can see that after putting a VA ECMO, the artery elastance increases as well as the wall stress increases. While if we went, the, the figure on the right side suggests that after putting an LV vent, the artery elastance doesn't change, but the, there is a significant reduction in the wall stress. So this helps in, uh, in the recovery of the failing left ventricle. From where the blood comes for the ventricle distension and dilatation, 
that is because of uh, increase in the afterload there is an increase in the trans aortic valvular gradient which further increase in the already failing left ventricle to much more reduction in the contractility and the closed aortic valve again doesn't allow the LV to pump the blood into the aorta. So, and there is an, in, if the venous return is inadequate because of the, uh, you know, the cannula or uh, there is a residual systemic return which is going into the LV, there are bronchial and thebation blood flow and if there is any degree of air, it may further worsen the LV dilatation. Now, in any VA ECMO, as Dr. Muli sir has rightly said that we need to monitor certain things. The serial echocardiography, transthoracic or transesophageal, putting a swine gas catheter and monitoring particularly the right side of uh, uh, pressure, right upper limb pressure and saturation is very important and needs. So before we move on to the devices and uh, available approaches for the LV unloading, there are some simple measures which can be taken, uh, which can be uh, taken, and this can help us a lot. Like if we, if on this monitoring and uh, you know, if we find that it's fluid overload, then use of diuretic or renal replacement therapy and adjusting the cannula strategy can help us here. If there is an inadequate return, if there is a low pulse rate with vasodilatation, the volume can be assessed and managed accordingly. If there is high pulse rate, the flow can be increased or we can add more diuretic and use CRRT there. It is very beneficial. If there is low ejection fraction, we can increase the anatrops and assess the hemodynamics. And IVP is considered if there is some contractility and some stroke volume. If the contractility further reduces and IVP doesn't help, or there is absent contractility where IVP does not going to help, then if on hemodynamic assessment, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is more than 20 to 25 millimeter mercury. We should consider unloading. And on echo, if there is a smoking effect or there is a low flow through the mitral valve, unloading becomes mandatory. So these are the factors which drive the unloading. If there is uh, on uh, on uh, assessing the patient, there is fluid overload, higher pulse vitality, or LV distension on echo, the unloading has to be considered. And if there is absolutely uh, no, no ejection or absent pulse stability or the smoking effect on echocardiography, then definitely unloading has to be done. Now, what are the you know, what are the ways of unloading the left ventricle? There are surgical techniques and there are percutaneous techniques also. Which techniques is suitable for which clinical scenario is not clear and mostly based on what is the primary configuration of the ECMO. In the surgical techniques, there are open surgical techniques and minimal invasive techniques. Like if patient is a post cardiotomy with the open sternum, then you can directly drain any chamber like pulmonary, through the pulmonary veins, LA or LV can be uh, drained directly or you can put a, a vent in the pulmonary artery itself. There are two papers from the Centrio et al. and Weyman et al. has uh, strongly recommended the LV decompression in refractory cardiogenic shock indicating the usefulness of this technique even when the central ECMO is placed in the non post cardiotomy setting. Their patients were pediatric patients and they suggest that uh, unloading is beneficial. In addition, Kotani et al. studied 23 children, 16 of whom uh, received LA decompression by means of trans -thoratic, thoracic LA cannulation with either a straight or right angle venous cannula placed via the right sided LA approach. The removal of cannula was achieved in 81% of the patient. In another pediatric experience, Hacking et al. decompressed the LA via cannula inserted into the dissected water stone groove in 39 children with a benefit. A few case reports of directly uh, putting uh, vent into the LB and uh, PA are there, but there are no robust series to evaluate. In minimal invasive techniques, there can be a sub zippered incision or right anterolateral incision to uh, drain the LA or left anterolateral incision uh, which gives us access uh, directly to the left ventricle or the pulmonary artery. In uh, one of the uh, study by Gurkis et al. Uh, used sub zippered technique and exposed the 
left uh, ventricular apex and uh, inserted the vent directly and uh, they used 16 to 20 French cannula is implanted in the LV and the tunnel through a sub zipper incision into the extra corporal side and found it to be useful. Chong et al. proposed a left anterolateral thoracotomy. This approach might be particularly useful when the peripheral ECMO is utilized. The vent cannula is placed in the apex by means of fluoroscopy or under the echocardiographic guidance. There is another uh, study by Takeda uh, et al. using a centromeg wad integrated with the ECMO circuit. And this is particularly useful if you want to convert this into uh, uh, a long-term support of VAD when the oxygenator is not required. Now, which chamber to unload is uh, debatable and depends on the clinical scenario and mainly driven by the risk of pulmonary congestion. If there is issue with the venous drainage, better to drain the PA or LA and unload. And if there is recurrent uh, uh, left-sided valve, then LA unloading is preferred and if LV recovery like in acute condition is the primary concern and there is very low or absent contract despite of anatops and everything done to unload LV unloading directly has to be done. Coming to the percutaneous techniques there are uh, various techniques like uh, percutaneously putting up uh, pulmonary artery vent uh, via the femoral vein has been uh, studied there is a transeptal puncture is done and a uh, drainage uh, cannula is put it from the femoral vein uh, through the transeptal puncture into the LA. There, uh, there are trans aortic vents are also put from the peripheral arteries. But this doesn't have a uh, robust uh, studies to support the use of this. There are random studies of one or two or maximum ten patients. There has been report of using uh, impeller device or tandem heart in association with the VA ECMO to unload the left ventricle. Papillardo et al. reported about 157 patients treated with VA ECMO, 34 of whom received concomitant treatment with impeller. They call it ECPELA. After a propensity score matching, 21 patients treated with the VA ECMO and impeller were analyzed. The VA ECMO and impeller group showed significant lower in hospital mortality and a higher rate of successful bridging to either recovery or further therapy compared to VA ECMO alone. Chang et al. described a decrease in the LV and diastolic diameter measured by echocardiography in five patients undergoing VA ECMO along with impl uh, implantation and four of the five patients were successfully transitioned to uh, uh, permanent VAD. Tepper and associate from the Washington University School of Medicine compared surgical venting and LV venting with Ampella for the patient on VA ECMO and they concluded that use of an Ampella was an effective means of LV unloading and prevented worsened pulmonary edema with outcomes and complications that are comparable to surgical vent. Lee et al. Uh, reported a case series of five patients treated with tandem heart and VA ECMO, however only two of them survived at the time of discharge. And if you look at a, a good literature review of uh, unloading left ventricle on uh, ECMO, we can see that there are large number of studies published in the favor of indirect LV unloading through IBP. Uh, we all know that IBP uh, in the most of our uh, clinical scenario is already placed or we place after VA ECMO to unload the left ventricle. Among this study, we see the larger uh, group of studies that Dahl et al, for example, treated 144 patients after cardiac surgery with IBP during VA ECMO and the use of IBP was associated with a significant higher survival rate and the use of IBP was ultimately an independent predictor of in-hospital survival. There is another study by Lean et al in uh, 529 patients of uh, which 300 patients combined IBP with VA ECMO and concluded that IBP helps in early winning of ECMO, but they failed to uh, you know, show any improvement in the in-hospital survival rate. And in a very large meta-analysis of around 2,095 patients, uh, Lean Y has tried to answer a key question that what is the effect of VA, uh, VA ECMO plus IBP in a patient on cardiogenic shock and found it to have a decrease in the hospital mortality and may cause may not increase any complication. Now this is a chart showing the uh, what are the most commonly vented 
the chambers and to achieve our goal for uh, patient survival we need to balance between the end organ perfusion and the function to the myocardial recovery and we can achieve this with uh, targeting uh, mean arterial pressure flows and unloading the left ventricle along with passing by the ibp uh, this is a this is an example of uh, how we can proceed that after initiating a va ecmo we should do a frequent echocardiography every third hourly and uh, basal pulmonary capillary weight pressure has to be monitored as well as the right sided uh, blood pressure if there is elevated distension on echo without pulmonary edema we can optimize general measures like diuretics maintaining the uh, low mean arterial pressure uh, required restricted the volume anotrex support and uh, crrt we can uh, get away without unloading but if there is uh, aortic regurgitation and there is no ejection and smoking effect on the echo in the left ventricle then we need to consider the unloading but if there is pulmonary edema with lv distension then there, then we should look for the uh, we should look uh, for the primary cause uh, for primary clinical condition for which we have initiated the va ecmo if the primary pathology is having a high recovery potential then we should unload and if there is low recovery potential then uh, we sh uh, along with uh, i mean uh, along with unloading we should look for the transition to alvet or uh, temporary bivet or heart transplant and if there is no lv distension we should still follow up with the daily echo and uh, monitor the pa pressure and the flows are adjusted and we can win uh, to conclude lv venting is becoming increasingly important or applied as it uh, not only improves the chances of survival or bridging to more sustainable therapies but reduces the adversity for the recovery of the sick left ventricle the consequences of failing to anticipate recognize and treat lv distensions are grave and may worsen an already distended and hypocontractile lv making myocardial recovery more difficult in addition to creating pulmonary edema and contributing to lv thrombus formation from blood stasis despite the well known controversies ibp remains widely used in combination of va ecmo and improves chances of ecmo winning and in hospital survival the literature on this subject remains very limited and needs more research and we need grounded data regarding the hemodynamic and physiological changes deriving from the each method described and it still uh, leads us with uh, few very unanswered or partly answered questions thank you very much